Hey YouTube, it's your history teacher here, Mr. Terry, with another history teacher reacts video. Today we are going to check out uh, overly sarcastic productions again. And when I saw uh, their list of videos, I saw this one. It said Historical Realism Review Assassin's Creed Odyssey. And this immediately got me sort of excited. If you guys know me, I'm a, a big into gaming and I love the Assassin's Creed series. Um, in fact, if you want to know about the games I like uh, in the Assassin's Creed series, I invite you to go over to my gaming channel where I just recently posted a video where I put into tiers all of the main uh, Assassin's Creed games. And you can go over there and kind of see where I'm at on uh, my feelings on those games. But anyways, Odyssey is one of my favorites. I'll go ahead and tell you it's in my top tier of, um, of Assassin's Creed games. And when the game was announced that it was going to be in Ancient Greece, that was huge for me. I love ancient Greece and I thought being able to live kind of in that environment would be very, very cool. So overly sarcastic, uh, those folks did apparently a video I'm guessing is going to kind of review, I guess maybe if it's realistic or whatever. And I get asked that all the time. Um, one thing I do on my gaming channel, if you didn't know, and be sure to sub to it if you haven't, but, uh, is I do Let's Plays, and one of the things I've done a lot of is is Odyssey. I get asked all the time about realism and stuff, and I give my opinions, but I really interested to see somebody else's opinion specifically on the game, and I know you guys really love this channel, um, the Overly Sarcastic Productions. I'm pretty new to them. I've only seen a couple of their videos, and I keep getting asked to do more, and I thought this would be a perfect way to do that. So we're going to go ahead and check this out. Now, the original video link is going to be down below, so make sure you go over there and watch it, give it a like, subscribe, give all that support, uh, because... Uh, these people need, you know, our love and support for making awesome content like this. And uh, I'd love to hear what you have to say about this. You can do that in the comment section. Come join our Discord server, which is linked below. Either way, let's go ahead and get started and let's see what they got. And I'll let you know what I think. When I first heard that the new Assassin's Creed game would be set in classical Greece, part of my very soul ascended to an ethereal plane of a higher existence, yeah, and me I saw too. the ghost of Thucydides himself shedding a single tear of joy. <laughs> Not only it's slightly exaggerating, but the fact is, your friendly neighborhood Blue was very excited. Fast forward to me playing this game, and it's everything I ever wanted and more. So today, I thought it would be fun for us all to take a look at this game to figure out how historically realistic it is. The short answer is very, but for the long answer, Let's do some history. But before okay. we jump in, huge thanks to Audible for sponsoring this video. Stick around to the end to find out how you can learn a whole lot more about ancient Greece for free with Audible. And I, I kind of do the same thing. I mean, he's, he said right there. So I guess they do their channel. There's like two different characters. And one of the other videos, I, th uh, I think it was the other the other character. I think they have like a boy and a girl or something that, that do that red and blue. But anyway, when they say, is it pre-realistic? I kind of say, yeah, too. Um, now, nothing, no historical game is going to be completely realistic because a truly realistic video game from a historic era would probably not be very fun. So the abilities people have, and it's a little over the top, of course, but I love the environments and stuff. So I'm kind of already on that, but I want to I want to see some more detail. From well, Ubisoft is not sponsoring this video. They are helping me give away one free copy of Assassin's Creed Odyssey, which is also very exciting. So stay tuned for that cool. too. All right. Definitely get say it. Right off Look out for this sales. Game world for sale is all the time. The best recreation of ancient Greece that you will find anywhere. The cities, sure. the countryside, the buildings, the people, the ideas, it's all truly Greek. Well, first off, are there are there games that try to do a realistic physical setting of ancient Greece like this? I was trying to I'm trying to think of other games that have done that before. If you know of any, let me know if they really try to hit this cuz I I'd love to, to learn more about it. The best compliment I can give this game is that it makes you feel like Spider-Man. No, wait, wrong game, sorry. When <laughs> you're playing this game, you are in a full, true recreation of ancient Greece, and the web swinging is fantastic. Sure, Damn it, wrong game. Though. Okay, sorry. I could gush for hours about all the little details they had no need to include, but did anyway. If you want to see me go slack-jawed in awe or giggle like a child at some parts of this game, I'd recommend checking out my Assassin's Creed Odyssey live streams, which I've linked in the description, and I'm sure have been flooding awesome. your sub box for the past month. Sorry. Cool, they stream For too. For this video, I'll Sweet. paint with broad strokes to show you what this game gets right and what it gets wrong. Like, like right there already, it's totally realistic. The Spartan kick, where you know you you fight them and then you you give them a kick and they fly like twenty feet. That happened. 
That totally happened, right? First and perhaps most important accomplishment here is the world. While lots of distances are stretched and shrunk, you can see sure. all of Greece represented here, and everything is in the right place. I like to describe it as true to the weight of the Greek world, if not the exact scale. Sure, yeah, I mean, so that's what they were doing, and if you've played Origins before, you see the direction they're going. And apparently doing the same thing with Valhalla, which isn't out yet, this is July 2020 right now when we're doing this, but I kind of like what they did, and they did it, I think, better in Odyssey, which was... You can make a whole country, right? You can make a whole region like this. Just scale it a little bit, right? Keep the proportions right, which I kind of think is what he's trying to say there. Keep the proportions right. But yeah, you can make it Athens. Just make it a lot more dense. You don't have to get, you know, you can make the downtown proper, not all the other areas. And I thought that was really cool here. Without it being too empty, like large, like too large and empty, it still had good detail, which really kind of captured to me the geography of Greece uh, really well. And it, it, I really like what they're doing. And I think it's cool that they're seemingly going to continue doing that with games going forward. I know Valhalla, I think, is supposed to be like that, where it's going to be a, a smaller scale, but large, or, but, a, but a total projection of uh, England. So although Athens might dominate the Attica Peninsula, if you hop on a horse and head northeast, you'll run into the plains of Marathon. Then if you follow the road south along the coast, you'll round Cape Sunio, just like you would in real life. And the whole game is like this. But yeah, I mean, like, okay, look over here. <laughs> this is like downtown Athens. Obviously, downtown Athens isn't like a fifth of all of Attica. You know what I mean? But it makes sense, though, because one of the places you're going to want is something like Athens to be dense because it was, you know, it's a big city and it's worth sacrificing some of the more maybe suburban regions in a place like Attica uh, than to give up on that, you know, with, with Athens. So I'm, I'm kind of cool with that even though the proportions are, you know, messed up and something like that. The world is filled with recreations of real monuments and buildings. In addition to the That's Golden Age works you'd expect, such as the Parthenon in the Oracle's Temple at Delphi, you can also find sunken Minoan ruins. I love that part. Mycenaean palaces for famous Trojan war heroes like Odysseus and Ajax. I love Minoan and Mycenaean history. It gets totally overlooked, and without, I mean, they're the they're the people that inspired really the Greeks, and the whole Greek mythology came from like Mycenaean culture, and 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 was brought down over the centuries. I love that they brought that stuff in where it made already an ancient Greece already feel ancient, which is what it would have been like even in, you know, 300 BC. Because there were, you know, these civilizations way before them that were on grand scales as well. And you think of Greece being like ancient Greece, the city states are here, Peloponnesian War as being so long ago. But man, there's, you know, you go uh, many centuries and before that. And I love how they captured that too. You're walking through. You know, you have these the modern buildings, which is so cool to go and see them in their livelihood. But then you also see the ruins of previous um, societies. I think that's awesome. They go out of their way to show you how layered the Greek world was, even as far back as this. And the best part is that the game map itself has a database function where you can read all about the location. Yeah, I love. I always love that about Assassin's Creed games, it, which is a really clever way to it's integrate to the read often the praised stuff. but clunky and less often used database from past games. And speaking of the map, a new mechanic they've added is the conquest system where you can sabotage war efforts to tip the balance between Athens and Sparta and, and just help makes territory change hands. While this is pretty much completely history breaking, it's very clearly for sure. the sake of gameplay and I'm honestly glad they did it that way because it's just more fun to have a hand in the movements of the war. By the way, I gotta do shout out to them of putting one of my favorite buildings ever, the Duomo in Florence right up there. Nice touch. Very much agree of gameplay, with that. and I'm honestly glad they did it that way because it's just more fun to have a hand in the movements of the war. In real life, Athens owned the Aegean Sea, and Sparta held on to the Greek mainland, and those borders didn't budge for 30 years. That's not the most interesting for a game, so I get it. And speaking of the Aegean Sea, let's talk about those new naval warfare mechanics. In addition to how pretty all of the Very ships fun. look, I really appreciate the strong emphasis on ramming and boarding enemy ships. Triremes were indeed the maritime powerhouses of the day, and that accurately reflects the way that they did combat. I really think I think it's done quite well, but the fact is that Triremes likes to sit high in the water with minimal drag to be as fast as possible. So when you also have two dozen archers and spearmen atop your decks, those ships would have tipped over in a heartbeat. I appreciate yeah. that they give combat an extra dimension for the sake of gameplay, yeah, which is important in an interactive video game, but it's worth mentioning specifically where the game diverges from the reality. Sure, sure, yeah, so they were, yeah, low like that, they were used as ramming. In the game, you have these arch uh you have archers and javelin shooting arrow and you know javelins at that and that's not going to take down a ship you know like they're doing there um but 
the the still a big mechanic of that is ramming. So what they would get those uh, kind of bronze rams, and think of it more less like you know the fighting in something like Black Flag, where you have guns and they're shooting back and forth. But in this era, it was like bumper cars in the ocean, where yeah they would ram. They had a, a hard and usually like bronze. Um, depending, it could depend on whatever material they use, but yeah, you would ram them, and of course, you could try to uh, board them. And it's something like the Persian Wars; they would do that, and then they would have the the army, the Greek army, over on the shores, like back over here, and um, yeah, like back over here, and then they would, you know, as the as the like Persian ships or I guess anybody you're fighting get sunk, they would swim over there, and then the army would be there to you know, cut them down. So obviously not very realistic that, the, 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 you know, the ranged combat and all that. Yeah. You might be able to shoot like, you know, the, the, uh, the, um, sailors, the ones that are above decks, a lot of them were below and could sit as only as high as like 18 inches from the waterline, you know, the, 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 where they would row from the triremes. But I love just being able to be in the triremes. Obviously they're going like crazy fast and all that, but uh, I think they mixed it, trying to be somewhat realistic, but also the most important thing, which is make sure it's fun. And I think they do that. And I like, I like in this game, one of my criticisms for like Black Flag is it was not a good balance, I thought, of, for me and my personal tastes of the naval combat versus land combat. And I thought Odyssey did a good job of making sure that's in there, but not too much or too little of it. But there is another problem with the navies. That is, Sparta is shown as having one in this game, when the fact of the right. matter is they couldn't navigate a bathtub without drowning. They didn't have the money or the resources for it, they were terrible at building the ships, and they didn't have the population available to row them. The I mean, it's, it's, it's a little harsh. No one in Greece, no city-state, has is completely clueless on navigating boats you know and using boats it's greece they're they're built upon the water they they at the very least they fish and do that kind of stuff but yeah definitely they put sparta and athens basically on par with each other and that's of course not true athens is the naval giant of the um, of the aegean there as they were their society was totally based on trade and sparta was focused on being self-sufficient but that is a yeah i mean a clear thing but to say i mean they're just completely inept i think that might be a little harsh but it's obviously not the focus for Sparta. The only reason Sparta won the war in the end was because they borrowed a navy from the Persians about 20 years after this game takes True. place. The reality in 431 BC was that the Aegean itself practically counted as a temple to Athena. There were so many Athenians running around it all the time. So rather than say this ad infinitum, I'm just going to put a Spartan trireme on screen whenever something is happening for the sake of gameplay. Because sure. just like a Spartan trireme, it makes the game better, but it's entirely made up. Okay? Sure. Deal. This next topic involves a spoiler from the first five minutes of the game, so warning, I guess. But anyway, the game opens half a century ago with the Battle of Thermopylae, where you play as King Leonidas fighting the Persians. Very it's a cool really way to start slick the game, sequence by that the way. instantly gets you into the setting. And even though it's not directly addressed, they show the simultaneous Battle of Artemisian between the Athenian and Persian navies, which is a really nice detail. And I was giddy to see Leonidas mowing down Persians with both points of his spear, because Greek spears were bladed on both ends, and no one seemed Seems to realize that, but they had this in the game, so I really like that. The only problem here is that there's not a phalanx in sight, and that carries over True. to the conquest battles between Athens and Sparta that you can participate in across the game world. Yeah, it's it's <laughs> it's like a giant bar fight. Then yeah, phalanx. So phalanx, if you if you know about that tactic, which would be used by Greeks and Romans and others, um, you basically move like a, a human mobile tank where you get together with your your shields and you have um, spears and you move kind of in unison that was the strength of the tactics and interesting those tactics continued on for centuries uh, but yeah this is just like a giant bar fight which again fighting in a phalanx i mean i guess that could be fun but for the melee combat style of this game it makes more sense to do what they're doing, but it would have been cool to to do that if you could if you could uh, learn that. But it also wouldn't because you're you're a mercenary, so I mean, like, what would you do with that? But I guess you could have done it like as Leonidas. That would have made the most sense to have uh, phalanx style battles there is with the Leonidas stuff, not with the Alexios and Cassandra stuff, but. Yeah. You can jump right into a massive brawl between hundreds of soldiers, but it's just that a brawl. 
In reality, Athens wouldn't dare fight Sparta head on, and they especially wouldn't abandon the entire concept of Phalanx Warfare just to, oh, fine, you're right, fair enough. <laughs> I just feel like there's something they could have done to bridge Spartan the gap Navy. between Come Phalanx on. and Battle Royale, so I would have liked to see that. And speaking of battles, I was really impressed by the portrayal of how Athens was handling the fact that Sparta was camped right outside their walls, constantly besieging them. This was a big factor for most of the war. The Spartans were ravaging Athenian farms left and right. So it Well, and this, this war took decades, too. So, yeah, it wasn't just like a big siege. That's that's not what was happening here. And they kind of got that right. You're you're into the game and right when you're in Athens, take a go ahead and look when you if you go into the game cuz I kind of missed it my first playthrough was the little encampments around, I guess you can call it the suburbs or whatever outside of the main walls of Athens that Spartan stuff and they destroyed all of these little villages and stuff. It was a neat little touch that I kind of was oblivious to the first time and then started looking at it more later on when I was playing. So it's fantastic to actually hear Pericles advocating for staying safe behind the walls while his counterpart Cleon and the others want to take the fight to Sparta. One side quest for the general Demosthenes has you stealthing around Spartan camps to take out their generals in a manner that's quintessentially Demosthenes, and I thought it was a really great way to merge gameplay, sure. character, and world building. If you love that, I know they're going to talk about it, but I loved... One of my favorite things about this game was seeing these historical characters come to life. Now, a lot of their mannerisms and stuff are going to be very theatrical and made for the game. You wouldn't really know a lot about that. But just just like interacting with someone like Pericles, who you read about, and you know, these famous speeches, or Socrates, right? Alcibiades, um, Demosthenes, they said. Like, it was so cool uh, uh, to see all of that. Hippocrates, I, I, I just love that. Whether, you know, they're real accurate depictions of them or even how they looked like it was just cool to see an interactable figure like that it just i don't know tugs on the history heartstrings if you ask me moments like this is where ac odyssey really shines yeah. the true to history personalities of the main players I agree. informing the accurate I agree. portrayal of strategic situations in the early phase of the war experienced directly through gameplay and all contained within a gorgeously accurate greek setting you've got it all it's perfect I don't want to spoil this next bit because it's honestly best that you see for yourself, but after arriving in Athens, you're treated to one of the most notorious parties in the Greek world, a symposium <laughs> at the house of Pericles. From front to back, this entire sequence is it's a wild. joy. You're able to chat with historical big shots like famous playwrights, squabbling sophists, my boy Socrates recreating a discussion pulled directly from the pages of Plato's Republic, which almost brought a tear to my eye, and a guest appearance from everyone's favorite historical sweetheart, Alcibiades. My only complaint, and this is an honest complaint, is that Alcibiades is not hot enough. Honestly, he doesn't do it for me here. Really expected more, more chiseled features, but that's neither here nor there. So He's got to be the most memorable character in that game. And if you've played it, you know exactly what I mean. He is he's such a interesting character to interact uh, with. <laughs> the good thing is that in addition to his characterization as a complete sex fiend, he's constantly scheming when you see him in yep. true Alcibiades fashion. I love it. Also, conversations with the famously shoeless philosopher Socrates tease entire platonic dialogues worth of philosophical discussion. Yeah, Those two they were are fun. standout characters since you spend so much time with them. But even still, for the most part, the portrayals of famous historical figures are true to who they were, even if they're not all super deep. In the case of Cleon, sure. even though you don't really see him a whole lot, I loved how he was trying to beat Pericles through the merits of his strategies rather than any underhand tactics. And last but not least, the Spartan general Brasidas is the biggest badass on the face of the earth. It's not quite the same <laughs> as actually having, you know, Leonardo da Vinci from the Ezio days, but it's definitely a step up from Caesar and Cleopatra from AC Origins, and I'm grateful for that. And speaking of characters, arguably the two biggest characters in the game are the cities Athens and Sparta themselves. Athens is this huge naval superpower that sprawls across the Aegean, and Sparta is this hulking behemoth with its claws dug into the Greek mainland. We know they're... But like they said, they don't really emphasize that. Like, I mean, when you look at it, like, it's just, it's even. Like, the naval stuff, Athens versus Sparta, and the land stuff's, you know, um, even too. They don't really show the differences in those societies and how it translated to war. I think they, they maybe they could have done that a little bit better. And yeah, like, I get you gotta, you know, have some naval presence to make it a more fun game with the, um, with the Spartans, but it didn't necessarily have to be like 50 50. Same with the land stuff of Sparta. Um, versus Athens. I don't think it had to be like that, but I don't think it's so bad though, like to, to show inaccuracies of the mili the military strengths of them that like really like detracts from the game. 
either I don't or, what do you think? but the game doesn't really ever say why, which is disappointing. Full disclosure, despite playing for several hours over two straight weeks, I haven't reached the late game yet, so this is a really hmm. big game, and, and things may change as I go I mean, that's along. That's fine. That's just... That's the, fine, though, because th then it's just main story stuff. Like, if you've played pretty far, you got to know basically all the characters and stuff like that, and you got to explore Greece. I think that's fine to be able to assess the realism of it, because there's obviously a big fictional story at the backbone of all this. Mid-game, I still sadly don't get a sense of what distinguishes these two. Since Sparta exactly. magically has a navy and there's virtually no magically hold its own in all of these open land battles, both of which are historically untenable, by the way, you really don't get a sense of why this war lasted so long. In real life, Athens' insatiable imperialism provoked the conflict, and then both sides wanted to string the other out i would say this i think this is i think he's uh, he's right here when you when you take a step back especially if you played it they really don't get into what the peloponnesian war was really about it's just like a backdrop now I, maybe that would be harder to tell because again it's like a multi-generation war pretty much it's decades but they they really don't teach you about the peloponnesian war about really why it's happening I mean, yeah, they have their fictional thing with the cult, but I mean, like, the actual historical reality of it. They really don't do that. Maybe that's a little bit of a missed opportunity um, to really go into why is why does Sparta have these grievances with Athens? Why do the other city-states do that, right? Maybe connecting that a little bit. Or maybe just, I mean, because it might be kind of intertwined in there a little bit, but may, maybe bring that to the forefront a little bit, which really, because they do try to make you kind of torn between the Sparta and Athens, but not for real historical reasons though if that makes sense Sparta wanted to starve Athens, but the naval supply chain and Pericles' defensive strategy stopped that from happening. Meanwhile, Athens hoped that Sparta would eventually give up and go home rather than try to take all of Athens' holdings in the Aegean through outright conquest. Just they true. both thought that if they just waited long enough, the war would end in their favor. The plot more or less blames yeah. the length of the war on this mysterious cult operating in the shadows, right. which I feel cheapens the narrative all around. And the sad thing is that the themes at play here in the history Relying are too much on the cult Assassin's Creed game. To tell the the story. whole idea is freedom versus order and chaos versus oppression. In the history, neither Athens or Sparta is really the good guy. Athens extended democratic rights to all of its allies, sure. but it did so through extortion and outright oppression. Sure. While freedom of speech was a staple of Athenian society, most women were cooped up on the second floor of the house. By contrast, Spartan women had much more autonomy, and True. Sparta's allies were much freer, but at the same time, their kings ran an oligarchic government, and Sparta enslaved an entire population called the Helots to power their economy. The themes of Assassin's Creed are practically bursting from the pages of the history books, so I feel like I shouldn't need to dig that hard or wait till the end to find these themes at play in the story. Actually, I totally agree with him there, uh, that those themes don't really come out. The The whole Athens versus Sparta cultural and societal debate is one that's really fun um, to have in, in classes. I like to really um, get into it with, with my students and get you know, we really uh, I, I, we do activities where we look at what society was like and, and stuff like that. And, uh, you yeah, know, what sport was like to be a Spartan, what, I mean, what it was like to be an Athenian, what it was like to be a man, what it was like to be a woman, a freed person, a slave. And it usually makes, if you really do understand the two sides, a pretty debatable thing where you can take sides and pros and cons and stuff like that. Because some people like, oh, Sparta, because of they uh, they're super strong and it'd be cool to do that. But then you look at like what society was actually like in Sparta, or you could be on the Athenian side, like they were democratic and freedoms. Well, they also had a giant, they also had a big slave class, and women were totally thrown under the rug. And yeah, they had democracy for like 15% of the actual population of Athens. So there's always like devil's advocate arguments you can play in that. And I actually think it's a really interesting and a really worthwhile discussion to have with people. Um, about this because you know it, it's you know, greek history has become so intertwined with world history and there's a lot of things that originate there but it's 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 really fun and interesting and really useful to get down to the real history that's going on here and the game like you're saying maybe didn't show that enough um if you were really looking to try to get at that out of your game for a casual player it doesn't matter at all I was over 30 hours in before I heard one character describe Athens as an empire, and it was a really good scene too, so I just want more of that. Well, I'm holding out hope for debatable. more of those themes when I get to Sparta, and if the rest of the game proves me wrong, I'll gladly add a card in the top right corner of the screen saying so. Yeah. I mean, not to get into the, the history lesson here that much, but I mean, the Athenian Empire was something that was being 
snuck onto the Greek world. And is what basically caused this war was the city-states finding that if Athens was basically trying to create an empire out of Greece ever since the Persian War ended with the Delian League. And... But yeah, that that's that yeah that's kind of thing. So like the whole M- idea of empire is you know um, maybe not when you compare like empires of the past. Okay, enough geopolitics. Let's talk about something less inflammatory and nitpicky, like the fact that you can play as a woman in this game. Now, as the playable character, it's perfectly natural that we can tank dozens of stab wounds, fall the entire height of the Acropolis without a scratch, and fight a literal Medusa. Not but sure. having boobs is just too darn unrealistic, right? Look, I get it. Women had very few rights in ancient Greece, so when we're talking realism, the idea of a woman having the opportunity to go out and do the stuff Cassandra does seems like maybe kind of a stretch. Sure, but that doesn't Honestly, matter. Honestly, between the warlike nature of the definitely female Athena, numerous accounts of predominantly female huntress clans dedicated to Artemis, and the entire history of the Amazonian women, it wasn't unheard of for badass sword-swinging warriors to also be ladies. So it's silly- Especially if you're a Spartan. I mean, they're they're Spartans here, the, the, the two. I mean, yeah, they're distanced from their Spartan ancestors but it made for a good one and um, I had heard this before that the original uh, protagonist that they had designed this game around was in fact Cassandra the the, the woman and Alexios her brother was kind of added in later I guess just to give well as a playable character right because if you play with them the other the one you don't choose is going to be a major part of the story but to make them both actually playable characters but I think I had heard that um, Cassandra was originally the the character, which you know, having played both characters, I don't know if it really changes much story because the dialogue is basically all the same, and it just because you're Cassandra doesn't mean all of a sudden the story becomes this thing about a woman being this mystios, right? This 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 powerful mercenary that the 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 gender differences really don't do anything to the story nor was it seemed even if it was designed for cassandra was ever seemed to really be a part of that unless they rewrote the story um completely to add in alexios that it did have more of a focus on uh, Cassandra being a woman and this this powerful figure, but that I don't know. ...to act like it's impossible within the context of the game. Unusual? Sure. But unrealistic? Nah. Okay, for real this time, moving on. One detail that they did a really great job with was the voice acting. Almost all of the characters, including the protagonists, are voiced by Greek actors, and it's great to hear authentic Greek pronunciations of words and names to give some extra flavor to the world. It, it's a little... Full Greek audio localization for Maximum Immersion, theatrical. but I understand why the financials of that one didn't work out. I do think... I do think the... I thought Alexios was way too cliche, and his... Like, I don't know, like... like I, I played as him first, and I was always like, oh, man, it's too much. Like, people don't talk like that. People don't do that. I actually like Cassandra's voice acting, uh, I think, better than Alexios. Still, it would have been very easy to make everyone BBC British again, but I really appreciate them going the extra <laughs> Unity. mile. Unity. It's great to hear Pericles talk in the Agora about that pest. That, uh, for whatever reason, that threw me off in Unity, where you have all these French people with British accents. I was like, just get some people with French accents. That's not hard. Spartan Polemarchos. And while we're talking about stuff that this game does really well, I'd like to gush about the presentation of cities. It's beautiful. In this game. The Greek world was built on the polis system, so it's cool to see how different cities come through. Athens, of course, is drenched They're in not, marble though. and splendor despite actively being under siege. It's also really nice to see the distinction between fabulous public works, the houses of the super wealthy, the districts of the pottery and sculpture artisans who make all that stuff happen in the first place, and the flooded neighborhoods of the Athenian poor. Megara, by contrast, is completely run down since it was a flashpoint of conflict on the peninsula between Attica and the Peloponnese, and it's an overgrown wreck in there. Really well done. Corinth, by contrast again, is lush and absolutely stunning while being corrupt to the core. The whole city is practically an offering to their patron goddess Aphrodite. Argos is a very yeah. old city that's I, been- I don't know, I mean, they did, they all have the same architecture though, which is true, like, how many temples to Athena and Zeus do you come across in the game that have the, the same exact styles? I didn't, I didn't really feel, though, in the cities, that you've, it, it didn't feel that much different, each of the city-states. Sparta, I mean, maybe a tiny, not even though, but like, yeah, I mean, you, you have to get into the actual dialogue to get into it, like the whole Corinth thing. That place was apparently a party, giant party brothel, 
uh, city state there and they they kind of really make that come through that's only through the dialogue as you're walking through a lot of the streets you don't get a feel of really any difference at least kind of in my opinion but that's okay it's not like I mean, it's still a common culture. You had these Greek city-states, and it may, wouldn't have been just vastly different. The way of life is still going to be somewhat similar. Built up over the course of centuries, so it's surrounded by Mycenaean ruins on every front. And that's cool. And Sparta is, well, kind of small, especially yeah. considering how important it was. Spartans are famously short with their words and stubborn with their architecture. The different sure. areas of the game world that's are justifiable. exploding with personality, and the Spartan art reflects the different local approaches to that Greek style. Richer areas have marble temples and flowing silk banners, whereas poorer areas are just built out of wood, and yeah. in some places the roof tiles are flaking off. The Odyssey yeah. team did a damn good job of making it all look beautiful and unique while keeping it accurate. That's I do love the the colorful nature of it. Uh, the really striking blue waters and then the white marble, and of course the, you know, the, the, the uh, marble temples were painted back in those days, and having those painted up and the colorful banners... Great uh, textures and lighting. You get the very warm light that's going through. Um, the the colors I thought were just beautiful. Where you have like a drab, something that makes sense. Something like Assassin's Creed Syndicate in London. You know, I'm glad they they kind of made this come uh, very very beautiful. It was stunning. The sunsets are great. The water. It really was a beautiful thing. And when you go and do those viewpoint synchronizations when you climb up on a building, it's fun just to sit there just for a sec and get the lay of the land. You know. I really enjoy that. It's not easy. The last big thing I want to talk about is mercenaries. In the game, Greece is filled with mercenaries looking to work for any side that will pay them. And that's your character's motivation for flip-flopping between Athens and Sparta at the whim of the player. They'll both pay you. And it's a little bit of a lame cop-out, but it's also... It is a cop-out. Mm. Right. <laughs> the boat has a point. In Greek history, mercenaries were hired out from various parts of Greece as complete sure. groups. And we have loads of documentation about mercenary bands of Rhodian slingers or Cretan archers in wartime, but it's unlikely that a standing army would let some rando walk up and fight in a battle. So be aware that the mercenary system for both the player and the NPCs you run into is pretty much pulled from thin air. I mean, it does make sense, though, that they, the main protagonists are, uh, are, are mercenaries, just so you can play in the middle of this war otherwise you could have this character that's just born and bred athenian or born and bred spartan and then you would never really get the perspective of the other side and I, I get the mercenary um thing that they went with but i didn't think there was really this huge emphasis though on like mercenary armies and stuff i never really felt that was something they were going for. Also, the Spartan kick is a completely ineffective combat technique in real life, and your character yeah, really but should it's the have a shield. Most if fun. Going to, no, I know. I just wanted to say it, okay? All told, those are the key takeaways here. The war, the combat, the battles, the geopolitics are all tweaked for the player at the expense of realism, but that's why this is a game and not a movie, and a fun game at that. There are other areas that the Odyssey team had much more freedom to tackle accurately without having to compromise for the requirements of gameplay or the narrative. And in every single one of those aspects, they absolutely nailed it. The world, the locations, the characters, the architecture, the landscapes, the seascapes, all are breathtaking, and all are lifted right from history and placed squarely in the palm of every single player. I'll say it again. Assassin's Creed Odyssey is ancient Greece. <laughs> And speaking of Odysseys, I've got the scoop on an easy and entertaining way to learn all about ancient Greece, and it's thanks to our partners at Audible who are sponsoring the channel today. With an astonishingly huge catalog of audiobooks to choose from, Audible is the place to go for all your literary needs. For me, working on this channel involves a lot of reading, and if you're in college, I can imagine you're doing the same, so I love being able to fire up an audiobook while I'm commuting to and from the library, or just have it playing in the background while I'm making some breakfast. Props it's to the audiobooks really for when we need book reports and stuff, summer. right? And for those of Listen on your way to work and because stuff. I don't talk quite as fast as Red does, and I'm sorry about that. You'll be glad to know that you can speed up or slow down the narration to fit your perfect pace. Audible members get a credit for any audiobook completely free every month, as well as additional discounts in the store. To get you started, Audible is offering all of you a 30-day free trial and that free audiobook if you sign up with our link on audible.com/overlysarcastic or text overlysarcastic to 500 500. 
Since we're on the topic of Ancient Greece, I was going to keep it on brand and recommend this audiobook of Thucydides' History of the Peloponnesian War, but then I found out that you can listen to Sir Ian McKellen himself narrate the Odyssey, and oh. I'm morally obligated to recommend awesome. that to you. Not only is it a really good translation of the book, but also it's Ian McKellen, guys, come on! So head over to audible.com slash overly sarcastic to have Gandalf himself tell you all yeah. about the world's worst navigator for free, or text overly sarcastic to 500-500. Now you see, the trick is that you listen to this while you spend hours upon hours playing Assassin's Creed Odyssey, and then you got maximal immersion going on. Serious. That's really what you want. And That's speaking of... Listen to Thucydides? Um, well, video games. Huge thanks listen to, to Ubisoft Thucydides for helping while playing Odyssey? Today. I need to do if that. You're one of our I don't know there was an audio book of it's never too uh, Thucydides. Late to That's join. Simply leave Thucydides' a book, The Pelican Rights. That's the video, classic. Which I've linked how below, uh, and I'll be picking Herodotus really random go to him for Persian War. You go to Thucydides for the Peloponnesian War. All right, well, that was great. Um, I found myself agreeing with a lot of things. There were a few things, you know, maybe I didn't fully agree on, but for the most part, I think that the sentiment, though, of the game and looking at overall as a very positive, I guess, representation of the Greece itself, maybe not as, as much of the, the storyline of the Peloponnesian War, but um, just the look and feel I thought was was great, just like I agree with that. But yeah, I think overall we're, we're very much in agreement of a lot of things. I think it nailed... A lot of things. A lot of things would have been impossible to sort of nail into something realistic because we just don't know, you know, um, some of those things. But I thought this was great um, to be able to see yeah, the realism. You could see he's he's very much a big fan. I'm I'm a big fan of it. Um, I love this game. It's in a top tier sort of ranking of, of the Assassin's Creed games for me. And um, I love the Assassin's Creed series in general from the fact that we can get, uh, like for me as a teacher... It gets a lot of kids that it kind of gets them into history through first being like video game players, which, you know, is very common. And I love that it just at the very least will get kids interested in asking questions. If we're in a unit and, you know, like Odyssey, if we're in our Greece unit, somebody like, hey, I remember playing this and meeting uh, um, Socrates. Oh, yeah, that was him. Like, you know, as we're talking about. I love that as like a tool to be able to do that. One thing they didn't get into, and maybe, I don't know if it had to come out then, is there is a really cool game mode in Odyssey that's great for learning about uh, ancient Greece, and that is what's called the discovery mode. Which basically puts you into the city, it takes out the cities, and it, it, they have built-in lessons that last about 15, 20 minutes, where Herodotus actually will give you a tour of some kind of topic, whether it's like Spartan military training or how the democracy of Athens worked. And I love that thing. I honestly wish I could just like, maybe I could do this sometime, bring my PS4 to the school and just go through that. I know some kids, it would be as interesting to them, but like... It's so cool uh, to have that educational element. Um, even just if I was to bring that like a PS4 to class and just use that discovery mode just to walk around. I've always thought that would be kind of cool for the next time I can I can teach like this unit and just walk through the city. As we're talking about the Acropolis and architecture, we go and walk around and stuff like that. I think that's such a cool thing. So anyway, I think, again, I think overall we both have a, a similar thing of what we were saying about realism. There's a lot of realism. There's a lot of not realism. But the non-realism is made to make it more of a playable game. Or more, yeah, more of an interesting game. Like, again, Sparta having a navy, which really wasn't much of a thing. Having that in there, you know, I don't think it, it takes away from it. It does make it a little bit less realistic. But it does add to the game being more fun that way. Um, but it didn't, I don't, like I said earlier, it didn't have to necessarily be like this. Or they portrayed them as a 50-50 in every aspect of this war, which was really just not the case at all. Sparta wins this war, you know, in the end. Although they do spare utterly destroying Athens. Uh, and again, just kind of starving them out, which is kind of the thing in a way that they kind of went with with the war as far as teaching about the war was like they were saying the Spartans basically be on the doorstep of Athens and trying to get these other city states to join them because that's really what the the Peloponnesian War is a civil war of Athens versus Sparta and each of their allies coming together with the major goal basically bringing trying to bring Athens down a notch, not necessarily utterly destroying Athens, because that was never really goal number one of the Peloponnesian War. It was to end this idea that Athens seemed to have of trying to make an empire out of Greece, which is something the Greek city-states didn't want, um, didn't want to happen. So 
Anyway, all right. Well, great, great things there. Um, like I said at the beginning of the video, if you're interested in more of my thoughts about the Assassin's Creed series, hop over to my gaming channel. I just recently did a video uh, ranking all of the mainline Assassin's Creed games. Um, and maybe you could, you, if you'd like to check that out, and you kind of see where I stand on each game there, and you can compare yourself that way. But uh, yeah, if you didn't know about the gaming channel in general, definitely check this out. I do a lot of these Let's Plays, playing Assassin's Creed and stuff. I've, I've been doing that, playing those games on stream. But we have a fun uh, new community. It's a new channel. So link will be down below so you can check that out. And yeah, I'd love to have you a part of that. All right, with that, um, I think I gave my closing thoughts about this. I love this game. Definitely play it. You can find sales and stuff like that. If you haven't played Assassin's Creed games, you can definitely jump into this because um, unless you're playing the earlier series, each game is kind of its own individualized thing. So definitely check it out. It, it can fit more of a hardcore or more a casual gamer. If you're someone that just is into history, you can do this too and take that casual approach because it's kind of something for everyone. So I really enjoyed this game. All right, guys. With that, we'll go ahead and end here. Links to other stuff down in the description. Thanks for supporting the channel by watching this video. Make sure you go down to the original video link, which is down below, to support these awesome folks over at Overly Sarcastic Productions. They do an awesome job. I want to make sure they get their due. All right, with that, we'll see you next time. Bye.